I'll tell you a little bit about the catapult and the satellite applications catapult, just so you see where it fits into the context of this. I actually didn't realize that I worked for um, a digital twin type organization. Uh, however, I've learned today that yes, we're uh, satellite applications catapult and a lot of the satellite and space industry actually are highly relevant to these digital twin uh, discussions. So. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read from this side over to that side a little bit uh, because I think one of the important things is that we're um, funded to a certain extent by the UK government, which enables us to be independent in that we're, we're, not, a, we're not a big organisation. We employ about 150 people uh, based in Harwell, which is just south of Oxford. And um, uh, the main purpose... Of, the, of our particular catapult, and I think most of the other catapults would be true to say, um, is that we're trying to encourage growth in the UK. And I think by extension, we could probably include Jersey in that as well. So it would be growth in jobs, growth in revenue, and using innovation uh, to actually do that. So the uh, government agency responsible for us is Innovate UK, or it's now actually changing its name, UKRI. Um, part of Bayes, the business uh, department, and um, uh, we work very closely with other government departments as well. Uh, so, what do I mean by space? It's not necessarily always what the uh, industry means, because uh, the space sector is quite stovepiped. You've got people who build rockets, you've got people who build satellites, you've got people who take the data from satellites as well. The, the clue is in the name, from my point of view, that we're the satellite applications catapult. So it's what you do with the stuff that comes off all of these platforms that are floating around um, in space uh, and in orbit here. There, there are three key technologies that we're particularly interested in. So it's um, the positioning technologies, it's called GNSS, but, but you would use it on a day-to-day -day basis, GPS, Global Positioning Systems, and its other flavors. So the European one is Galileo, there's one from China called Beidou, and there's one from India as well. But lots of uh, um, different ways of um, um, gathering data about position, timing, because they've got atomic clocks on them, and navigation. So this tells you uh, your heading as well as your immediate location. Um, and then uh, we've got satellite communications. I've just got a standard maritime picture there. Most people may have heard of Inmarsat. There are lots of other satellite comms companies, Viasat, Utelsat. They've all got sat at the end of them. They're not very original. Um, but this is uh, the key feature about satellite communications is it's global. So these things work and can transmit um, imagery, voice, IoT data, whatever you like, globally. And that's uh, um, the, one of the things that I want to sort of point out, that we're trying to develop ubiquitous communications. So as was said earlier today, um, you might not know that you're connected. Well, you would if you were in the middle of the desert, because you, or rather you may not be connected if you were in the middle of the desert or on the poles or whatever it is, but satellites give you access to connectivity where, wherever you are in the world. That's the intention there. And then uh, the other, the third sort of st uh, leg of the stool is Earth observations. Again, um, virtually everyone uses uh, Earth observation one way or another, remote sensing. This is uh, the Google Earth type thing. Um, Google Earth is uh, really useful, and it's getting people used to using this kind of data. Uh, but the, the sort of things that we're talking about would also include radar from space or other types of sensors from space. So it's not just optical. So we're talking about all sorts of things. Uh, the, the reason the catapult gets involved in these, you know, all these are run by very big companies that can look after themselves. Um, but what we're trying to do is find those gaps where maybe the different technologies aren't working well together or they're not being taken up as well as they could possibly be. So the sort of things that we're looking at, when we're talking about navigation, when we're talking about GPS, is kind of the resilience of the GPS signal. Can someone hack into it? So it's the security aspects of that. Uh, when we're talking about communications, it's talking about taking satellite communications and linking them together with terrestrial uh, uh, 
telephones and mobile phones or, you know, the last meter type Wi-Fi and Zigbee and uh, LoRaWAN, which we've heard about earlier today. So it's getting them all to work together to give that truly ubiquitous flavor to uh, communications. Um, What's the bit there, remote sensing? Uh, what are we doing special on that? It's really what we're talking about when we're, why we're involved in remote sensing, what's the added value that the catapult brings, um, is getting the satellite remote sensing to work with other forms of sensing. So it will be from drones or subsea um, uh, sensors or fusing data together to eventually produce what was said earlier today about uh, moving to the right, understanding a question. So we're not that interested in the technology, but what question can this answer? So it's helping frame that question and then seeing how it could be used. And um, to that extent, we've had to look in certain specific sectors. I, I, I tend to think of uh, the services that the space produce a bit like a utility, whether it's telecoms or electricity, um, it's, we don't know what's going to be done with the information that comes off these satellites. Also a bit like the analogy with the Apple iStore, um, you know, other people should come along and take this data and do something with it. However, we've decided that there are kind of four key areas that we can actively contribute to. So intelligent transport, this is um, predominantly, even though we've had some involvement with uh, um, autonomy. It's predominantly about communications between the car, uh, the car and the roadside, car and car, car back to central areas, infotainment in the car. So it's, it's making sure that works both in London and Milton Keynes and Jersey and also the Outer Hebrides of Scotland and um, working in semi-polar areas. I'll be a bit cautious in case there's sort of real experts here for uh, polar areas. There is a distinction there. Um, sustainable living. Uh, most of the things that the catapults uh, do, uh, we, we don't want to do anything that on uh, a Sunday morning is on the front page of a paper saying they've been involved in X, Y, and Z. So much of the work that we do is related to the United Nations sustainability goals. So it's talking about sort of uh, stopping illegal logging and forestry, uh, illegal logging in Malaysia. It's um, things like uh, helping stop uh, illegal fishing around the world, um, helping farmers produce uh, better crops with less inputs. Um, what else are we doing? Mining, trying to, we're, we're working in Chile, uh, using satellites to help the mining companies reduce their footprint because mining is going to carry on anyway. Uh, it's producing copper there that we need for all the other bits and pieces that we're doing. But helping them do it in the, in the most environmentally and sustainable way, we're using the whole range of satellite services um, that I've mentioned before to, to help to encourage them to do that. Um, and government services, I've, I've already mentioned about the blue economy, um, that's uh, the illegal fishing. I'm particularly interested in smart ports and smart islands as well. Um, but certainly, uh, more, you know, encouraging uh, better use of the seas in a sustainable way is, is uh, often it's satellites that are the things that can provide the data that feed back into policy or back into actual activities. Um, lastly, government services. This is, this is kind of a, in, an internal looking thing. How do we get UK government to use satellite services more efficiently? They're buying them anyway. They buy a lot of um, satellite data. They buy communications. They buy geospatial information. Um, but they're kind of siloed and they're buying it all separately. So we're trying to say, look, over here you're buying exactly the same thing as you're buying here. Let's uh, coordinate this a little bit. So that's a kind of bit of a navel gazing activity. Um, I put this slide up here to show where satellite services are involved, maybe not, not sort of specifically in a digital um, twin way, um, but we do get involved in so many different aspects of an activity. I just, I just thought, what, what might be of interest to Jersey that, you know, wind farms? I know it's not a big thing here at the moment, but it could be in the future. So all the different kinds of services um, that are provided Bathymetry is quite interesting. This is looking at uh, the, the shape of the um, floor, sea floor, um, under, under the sea. And traditionally, that would be done by sonar. But in fact, it's actually quite expensive to send a vessel out 
drop a, drop a hydrophone and, and um, understand what the shape of the floor is, doing mapping underwater, basically. Um, there are a number of companies, and maybe I should have said at the, the start that we, we're, you know, we don't represent companies, but we do try and promote um, UK-based companies. So there are a number of companies that are looking at can, what can you see from space uh, under the sea? Not very much unless it's in shallow and clear waters. However, that's quite useful for some people who are doing civil engineering works along um, a seafront. And it just so happens that most, much of this work is being done in island states, rather nice sort of Caribbean type places. But uh, uh, you can use um, space to derive bathymetric measures. Um, I won't uh, dwell on this too long, but uh, I, think, I think you get the idea that at any or at many parts of a major program, if, if you were talking about sort of your um, tidal power systems, if rather like the French, if you wanted to build one um, here, you would naturally be using satellite services. What we would be saying is that we'll help you use the most appropriate satellite services and try and uh, um, get companies involved in that. Um, now, really all I'm going to do for the next five minutes or so is run through some different types of imagery and services. We, we saw earlier quite a lot of things about ports. Um, understanding throughput in ports, security of ports, uh, where new parts of the port should be built. Uh, we can do this from space. And the reason you might want to do it from space, uh, well, certainly the reason you might want to do um, sort of uh, seeing changes that are taking, from, taking place um, why you might do that from space is it might be in um, uh, a country wouldn't have access to this kind of information previously. So this, this is a global thing. This can be done in any port in any world, uh, any part of the world. Um, the radar on the left-hand side, that's just an image. That, that could, the interesting thing about using radar as opposed to a normal optical camera is uh, it works day and night. It works through the clouds. And the data that you get off it is highly digitized. So you can start using artificial intelligence or machine learning to <clears throat> identify things that you're interested in. So how frequently do the vessels come in? Um, uh, has something been built uh, along a causeway? I mean, obviously, at the moment, uh, uh, we're, we're interested in what's happening in the South China Sea, with new islands being built for strategic purposes, and just understanding how these are being extended and what, what's actually going on there is, is, a, is a relatively simple um, task for, for the satellite community. Um, the other things that clever people in universities are using different types of satellites and, and the data from satellites um, using both radar and optical to do things like container counting. They've come up with algorithms that if you, if you take a picture slightly at the side, you can build a 3D model and then you can start um, uh, understanding the um, economic uh, activities in, in a port by knowing how many containers. It doesn't tell you what's inside, uh, actually, but that's a completely different project that the satellite world is involved in, in, in uh, container monitoring, not just tracking, but knowing what's going on inside containers. But again, it, this is something that is done um, on a, on a, can be done on a global basis um, and remotely, so you don't have to go and visit these places. Uh, the, other, the other interesting thing about satellites, and, and I was taking on board the earlier comments about digital um, twins being dynamic, so you want to keep feeding data in to the, into the system. And th this is why um, satellites can be used for that, because they're returning and revisiting on a regular basis. You'll know exactly when that satellite is going to be over a particular point on the Earth. And so you can feed that data into your model and say, well, actually, nothing's changed today. Then a couple of weeks later, yeah, something's changed. And then that goes back in and feeds the model again. Um, the challenge that we've got in the space community is resolution. So it's seeing things down to a very small um, scale. You may have seen things in um, you know, Hollywood films where they're down looking at cigarette packets on the floor or something like that. Um, maybe some people can do it. I don't know about that. We don't think we can do it. Uh, commercial satellite imagery, optical imagery, is down to 30 centimeters like this. So you can clearly distinguish something about 30 centimeters. So it gives you um, uh, good for counting cars. Certainly, I mean, you can see that 
the chips and things like this. Very easy there. So this can be the data that's feeding back into uh, a digital twin. Um, anything else of interest on that? Not particularly. This, when I showed you previously um, radar, um, this is synthetic aperture radar, and I thought it would be useful for people talking about digital twins and the construction industry, um, building, building management systems, uh, planning, that sort of thing. It doesn't look very much, but this is Munich, I think. Um, and basically what this is, is um, uh, an image of radar that's come from a satellite. So it's, synth again, synthetic aperture radar. Technical term is INSAR, interferometric synthetic aperture radar. And really, it's th this is made up of about 40 passes of a satellite that's gone over probably over a few days. And these are just points on there. And they're saying exactly what the location is. When a, 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 a synthetic aperture radar can actually tell you to less than a centimeter if there's been any movement at all. Now, the, the challenge is that the Earth is actually always moving. Um, buildings are always moving, tiny amounts. But what happens if it's moving more than the, um, uh, the threshold level that you've set? You get that little red dot. You get a, a, a different color in the middle there. That shows that that building is actually moving by quite a considerable amount. It can also... Uh, I don't have it with me, but we've got um, imagery of Crossrail in London. When they were, when they were um, uh, building the uh, tunnels under the ground, you could actually see settlement in the land. And that's interesting for the engineers, because if it suddenly goes into the red zone, um, they're going to have to start thinking of propping up or doing something. Um, this, this is also used for natural um, activities around volcanoes, um, or anything where you've got vertical movement, not very good for horizontal. But again, taking this and using it with other sources of data is very, very powerful. And this is, this is all um, digitized, it's stored. Um, I know we were talking about the huge amounts of data with the telecoms industry earlier. These are really big files that you don't want to be shifting around very often. So actually, the, the discussions about edge computing earlier are very relevant to this kind of analysis as well. Um, uh, so, you know, this can be used for planning in cities. There's, um, I was talking to someone earlier today, there's some work going on um, talking about uh, quantum technologies. And quantum technologies, uh, quantum gravity sensing will eventually, in 10 years' time, 15 years' time, be able to be much more, um, uh, much less coarse, much finer than this, and will be potentially done on a global scale. So you'll actually be able to see what's underground as well. So this is a bit like ground penetrating radar, but going a lot deeper. So when you're talking about your digital models, and we, we're sort of talking about stuff that we're doing today, bear in mind that these technologies are coming along very fast behind it, and we can start adding more and more information. The, it does seem that the one thing these digital technologies have in common um, is they're generating more data, I mean, big volumes of data, and it's almost exponential. So storage and managing it's going to be a, a really important aspect. Um, this is... Uh, I mentioned about sustainability and mines, and this is an open cast mine. Um, I've just put this picture in, really, to, to sort of say, we, we don't see this as a digital, uh, as a um, digital twin model. It, we're, we're talking about geospatial data cubes, which means you're layering on lots of different types of data all the time. And, but it's, it's the common thing about the um, uh, digital twin is that, um, all the stakeholders that have an interest in that information can draw the information out of it because it's produced in a standard format. The Australians are very good at doing this at the moment. We've been helping them do that. Um, and it's not just satellite data or space data. Space data will be one of those elements in there, but there'll be you know, um, standard ordnance survey data, then there'll be hydrographic data, then there'll be uh, data from any other partners that want to contribute to the, a, a cube, a geospatial cube. And then it's a question of pulling information out. I can imagine that you could put stuff about um, um, 
human activities, you know, or economics could be another layer in that. But we're, that's not our expertise. We're doing just the geospatial bit. And um, this was um, a particular project we're doing at the moment with uh, Fiji. Um, they wanted help with civil, con I put this in because it's in Ireland. Uh, they wanted help with uh, uh, planning for tsunamis and storms and civil contingencies. And we did suggest that, uh, and, they're, and they're doing it, that we will help them build uh, a cube of data for all the different types of data that they need so they can extrapolate from it the information they want. We're not, we're not building them a civil contingency system, but we're helping provide the geospatial data that they need for it. And that's becoming a very common um, activity in the geospatial world. Lots of very large companies involved in that. Um, I haven't really spoken much about how comms work, which is obviously directly relevant to IoT and, and other things like that. Doing some work up in um, uh, Scotland, I put this on because it makes me cringe a little bit. Um, that's a tiny, that's a little, it's called a pill cam. Um, and it's got a camera in it, you swallow it, takes images of uh, your inside. I've no idea how it comes out again, but, but the, the, point being, <laughs> yeah, the, the point being is that it uses satellite communications to get that from your outer Hebrides island um, back to head office in uh, Glasgow or wh wh wherever it happens to be. Um, and it means that it saves the uh, citizen traveling to the main hospital. It, it can be handled by a nurse locally, or it's, it saves the um, surgeon who might be a world specialist from actually going there. Once you've got the data, you could send that anywhere in the world, and people could actually have a look internally. Um, and it, I mean, it's basically an act, it's something that's done in a, in a waiting room almost, or you know, in a little clinic. And lastly, sorry, looking at your watch. Uh, lastly, I've, to give you an idea of the sort of things that are coming along, there's a relatively small company called EarthEye. Um, they're growing very, very rapidly. I'm not advertising for them, but I think it's quite interesting. Um, they've, uh, they've demonstrated the use of video on small, low Earth orbit satellites. And the intention is that um, uh, which works quite well. You can see stuff like this. I, I decided not to put, it's a huge file, so I decided not to put a video here, but imagine these cars are moving and then they tag them with their speeds. Um, they don't put registrations on them, but, but that could come from a different database. Um, or it could be linked into a motorway tolling system or something like that. Um, but their intention is to launch a series of satellites. So you've got a constellation of satellites. Currently, um, the one satellite they've got takes an image for about 20 seconds or maybe 60 seconds with lower resolution. I'm not quite sure what you could do with that. It's interesting, but um, you know, it's not that commercially exploitable. But the, um, the other satellites, when they're all there, it will be almost continuous video from space. And then that will be interesting. So you'll have video over an area. There may be um, security and personal liberty issues there, but that's something you'll have to take up with them, I think. That was it. So that's a quick rush through satellites. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much indeed, Sean. <laughs>